Well, good morning uh, and welcome to this rather nippy Thursday morning. Um, this is a live financial mail red zone in conversation with event. And this morning we're talking all things snacking. So given the COVID-19 global pandemic, people are staying home to stay safe, representing a significant shift in consumer behavior. But what is the impact of this changing behavior being in the category of snacks? And how have some of South Africa's largest snacking companies adapted in real time to satisfy their consumers' new needs? That's what we're discussing this morning with the Financial Mail Red Zone In Conversation live event, the science behind snacking and delicious marketing tactics for 2021. And to help us unpack that topic are the kings and queens of snacking in South Africa. Sarvesh Sitaram is the uh, Corporate and Group Marketing Strategy Director at Tiger Brands. Zainab Mohammed is the Category Brand Manager for Candy at Mondelez International. And Yandisa Hene is uh, the Chief Innovation Officer at Yanda Innovation Consultants. And this morning, we're unpacking all things snacking. Um, so, Sarvesh, let me start with you. Let's get straight into it. Um, because, I, I mean, I think I've been snacking a little bit more um, because obviously I'm about a meter away from the pantry every day now. Um, but if we had to kind of open the conversation um, and we look at what this impact of COVID-19 has been in terms of how consumers have changed behavior in the category of snacks, what's the kind of overall sentiment? Obviously, it gets very specific as we start moving through different categories of snacking, but overall COVID-19 and snacks, what is the impact to be? Yeah, thank you, Arya, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, yeah, so snacking had indeed sort of undergone a metamorphosis over this uh, COVID period. And the one word that I would use to describe the impact on the category is significant. And it depends who you speak to. I'm sure the other panelists would have a slightly different point of view. But they, within the snacking category, I think it's being significant for brands that are consumed at home versus brands that are consumed out of home. And they've experienced mixed fortunes under this COVID situation. And I mean, your point is, speaks exactly to that with regard to spending 24 hours at home now and your proximity to your pantry uh, and your fridge allows you to sort of nibble and snack much more than you would have ordinarily. It was a trend, by the way, that we saw uh, on the horizon and began to hit a few categories already. But uh, the advent of COVID and spending more time at home has undoubtedly accelerated all of that. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, out of home, for example, if you're on the go and uh, you were used to grabbing a drink and a pie on your commute to work or home, that doesn't happen anymore. But uh, making better use of what you have at home has definitely seen a blossoming. I mean, who doesn't, who hasn't tried banana bread and, uh, and how you snack off of that over a number of days uh, over this period? I mean, just one example, and we'll get into more detail. So, Yadi, let's pick up on uh, what Savesh has been sort of speaking about. Um, now you're in sort of March 2020, moving into April, May, June, July, moving through 2020, coming into 2021. You're at the virtual boardroom table because not everyone's around the table anymore. And what are you kind of speaking to brands about? in terms of adapting in real time to these consumer needs, because a factory is geared to make a certain product in a certain way, and you can't just reinvent what that factory is making overnight. So how do you go about innovating based on what's happening with COVID-19 um, and getting the brand to release new stuff that's adapting to the audience, but in a sort of timeier sort of fashion? So I think, um, Ari, the first thing I would say to brands is firstly embrace the underlying shift in technology and societal shifts that are taking place as a result of COVID. The reality is that the trends that once drove snackification have actually really shifted. Now the trends are shifting to more healthier trends, to more um, larger packs for sharing, and to more healthy, co healthy consumption. So obviously brands do have technology that can actually address those, those shifts and trends. Also, one of the reasons I would also say embrace it is because there's so many opportunities, Ari, that are actually up for grabs. Right. So, firstly, there's a lot of meal occasions that are up for grabs within the snack within for snacking products. There's lunch and there's breakfast that's up for grabs. Home, um, home tainment is also up for grabs as a new frontier for premium innovation. You'll see what Magnum Unilever has done overseas, where they've actually brought that store experience 
from, I mean, the, the experience used to be able to get for Magnum in store, and now they've actually brought it into the home with Magnum kits. So embrace those changes that are actually coming. But finally, Ari, I think what's very interesting about, about, about COVID is that there's an opportunity to also learn from other categories and subcategories, right? So if, if, if what I would say to brands is you see energy drinks are on the rise in value and volume. You see instant coffee is on the rise. So is there an opportunity to collaborate with, with, with those kind of brands? Is there an opportunity to bring that energy element into the innovations that you, that you are actually making? Uh, vitamins, for instance, are on the rise, which means there's a need for uh, addressing immunity. So do you start making immunity claims? So there's very really small tweaks that you can actually make without changing your entire supply chain, um, if, you know, your entire supply chain in, in the factory. So those are some of the advices that I would give uh, brands if I was sitting at a table. And this is a great, um, this is a great kind of example of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You think COVID-19, everything has to change, um, but not everything can change overnight and it doesn't necessarily have to. You have to kind of tweak in real time and ultimately if you pivot by one direction point today, by the end of the year, you're in a completely different direction, but it's a slow kind of process and a slow burn. Zainab, talk to me for a second about what that implies in terms of a consumer engagement strategy because you number one have to figure out what you're saying you number two have to figure out if it's going to resonate with the audience and you have to be really connected with that audience so when we look at sort of a consumer engagement strategy as a snacking provider or a snacking company what are some of the tweaks and the twists that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic yeah thanks for that question Ari so you know I think with the pandemic, there was certainly uh, a behavior of capitalizing on the moment. So, you know, as Sabir said, uh, you know, who like consumers were baking more in home, right? There, there was definitely um, the shift in consumer behavior with people being at home. So one of the changes was put out a lot more recipe posts, right? So if on digital, I guess every single brand was providing recipes. Um, I guess banana bread was probably the number one recipe that was shared online, you know, but that was maybe a small, quick tweak that I think every company uh, adapted to. But I think beyond that, you know, the longer term impacts of the pandemic was that brands honestly realized the importance of authenticity so it's important to share with people what you believe in as part of your communication strategy. You know, consumers want to know, why do I need to trust you? Why do I need to let you into my home, right? So there was definitely this need for being more authentic, more upfront. Um, you would have seen all the communication changes around, we're in this together, right? Um, tackling some of the emotions around loneliness, you know, the elderly who were alone, you know, the fact that our lives changed. I mean, I think the chicken lick and advert was probably perfect around that for South Africa, but there was definitely this need to be authentic, to embrace our challenges and put that forward to consumers. Um, and I think the second key thing, and it's probably, um, you know, the buzzword around, but empathy, right? For brands to have a purpose. I think, you know, consumers are a lot more aware of their surroundings. Um, they're a lot more informed and it's not enough for businesses to just bank the profits, right? There has to be an, a purpose behind the brand. There has to be a purpose behind the company. And I think, you know, all of your panelists here today have been involved with brands or companies who have purposes, who do give back to their communities. Um, so, that is what I would say would be the two or three key things in terms of how we have adapted our consumer engagement strategies to meet the pandemic. It's, it's easy to sort of speak to this on a call um, and it, it sounds fantastic and uh, easy and we whiz through the nine to five and we make these things happen. But Savesh, even I get uh, a little bit nervous when I look at the amount of brands that Tiger Brands have under them. And I think the poor guy that's behind trying to streamline all of this um, and innovate within each of these brands. I mean, these are massive portfolios. We're speaking about tons and tons of product being shipped to supermarkets all around South Africa every single day. Um, and I guess picking up on what Zainab was saying, you know, how do you begin to stand out? And even in a context of Tiger Brands, how do you make sure that each brand stands out? 
Um, because we're not just saying that Tiger Brands needs to stand out, we need to say that they've got competitors in every single different category and how do we really differentiate ourselves? So how do you kind of overseeing that begin to give each brand what they need and give them that competitive advantage? Absolutely, Aryan. And it's a great challenge every day because I think part of the scale does create a lot of the challenges. How do you continue to bring the, the power of Tiger Brands products uh, to the fore in store and in consumers' homes every day? But it's something that I think with 100 years experience under our belt uh, as a business, we um, have good experience in knowing how to do that. But I suppose if we get back to saying during this last year and a half, how have we done things differently? And how do we continue that success? I suppose we could talk about the really good stuff that talk about changing dynamics and how do we feel that? And I'll get to that just now. But I think if you reflect back on March of 2020 and uh, there was this talk of a curfew and a lockdown and all that, what is the first thing that people did? They went, to the, they went those that could afford, by the way, went to the nearest shopping uh, complex and they began to stock up on things that they felt were going to be in short supply, whether it be uh, fatty ammonia pasta or two baked beans or whatever that might have been, all of which puts a huge strain on the supply chain that wasn't really geared for that huge uplift in volume. And that in itself, as the entire value chain, can be quite up upsetting uh, in terms of the planning, etc. But if you bring it back to the fundamentals, then now, even sort of a, a year and a bit further on from that, we have, have all learned. We know how to manage those disruptions a little bit better. But uh, effectively, it does boil down to the simple basics. And the three that I've um, summarized it for is around availability. Because regardless of how much purpose you have and how much uh, interest consumers have in you, if you're not available when they want to buy you, you're not going to get chosen. In fact, we found that uh, this particular pandemic uh, has created more opportunity for consumers to sample other products that may not have been their first choice because their first choice wasn't available on shelf. And that's about the fundamentals. The second one is about affordability. And, and I mentioned it happened last year, only those that could afford to can be loaded. And the situation hasn't improved, it's still perpetuated now. So I think ensuring that in addition to having brands that are good, having brands that are affordable uh, to the vast majority of your target consumers is critical. And then the third one for simplicity, I've uh, summarized it as attractiveness. The first part of attractiveness is taste. I think consumers have time and time again said that they would not compromise on taste. So what is it that your brand promises and how does it deliver against that expectation? And the other part of attractiveness is the brand profile. And that's what they need to talk about. Is that does your brand have a role to play in that consumer's life beyond the fundamentals of being available, being affordable and being tasty? What else does your brand do? And I think within Tiger Brands, we've been on a journey of really starting purposes uh, beyond each of our billion rand brands, as we call them, and we're looking to expand that across the rest of the portfolio so that it becomes less about we are doing something for the community, but making that consumer feel that we, together with them, are making an impact to society in whichever way that could be. Because it shouldn't just be a sponsorship or something. It needs to be something deep-rooted in the brand that actually creates a feeling of warmth when that consumer chooses us. So it's a great challenge every day, but it's a challenge we're up for, and uh, thankfully one that we seem to be doing well against. I mean, it's it's really interesting when you put it like that, because you know, as marketers, I guess you could sit on a call and say, you know, it's we, it's about how awesome our TVC is, it's about how well we art direct the food, mm -hmm. and then so as you bring it back to basics and say, well, is the stuff in stores because everybody's gone and bought all the canned foods, and the factory literally can't keep up yes. with that. Um, Yandi, talk to me from a, I mean, it's one thing to, to innovate and perhaps it's a two part question. It's one saying, what is the importance of innovation? And it's two saying, what is the importance of seeing that innovation out? Because from the start point of an idea to the end point in terms of getting it into stores is not a quick process. There's so many stakeholders. There's a retail person that has to shop it to every retailer in South Africa and get the space. And is it high enough on the shelf? And, you know, we think that it's this fast paced industry, um, but by the time you get that thing into a box and delivered to a store, months have gone by. So how do you plan that innovation that, you know, 12 months down the line, your COVID strategy when everybody's been vaccinated actually still lands and people still want that product?
Sorry, Ari. Sorry. So I think let's start your first question because you actually had two questions and one was like the importance of innovation, right? So the reality, Ari, is that innovation actually helps you stay ahead of the game because if a, a company that innovates is usually very agile, they are able to adapt to change. And therefore, when you have something like a global pandemic that is totally unforeseen, you are actually fit. You are, it's a company that's fit for purpose. And we've seen what happens with companies that don't innovate, such as your Kodaks. It means that you are so focused on your current success that there's actually a revolution that's about to start. And you're not even aware that there's a revolution that's about to start. You actually get left behind. So innovating is so important. It also means that when you're innovating, it means you're consistently listening to your consumers and observing your consumers' um, changing behaviors. And there's nothing else that's going to get you to stay ahead of the game than actually coming up with technology that addresses those consumer behaviors and consumer needs as quickly as possible and ahead of your competition. So that's the that's the first thing. Now, the second part of your of your of your question is, you know, around getting innova uh, innovations to speed in market. You know, I, I re Ari, one thing I've realized about innovation is it's almost like exercising. Right. Once you kind of get into it and you get into the rhythm of it of having innovation ideations, of having processes in place, you find that you're actually able to shift and navigate um, difficult times and changes with, within, within uh, obviously, the, within the industry, right? So what tends to happen is you just need to make sure that you consistently have a team uh, that champions innovation. You need to consistently make sure that you're collaborating internally. You need to make sure that you are actually... Um, what what can what can I say? You 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 dedicate resources to innovation, and you're not only doing this when there's a pandemic, but it's something that you're consistently doing, so that when they when something does happen, you're actually fit for purpose as a company. Yeah, Ari, can I come in there as well? Just to build on, I think Yan is sort of told what one and the innovation culture, as we call it, needs to be embedded in the organization because only then can it sort of be fluid and deliver what you even in amidst changing times. And a lot of that, I mean, you hear the word in many organizations talking about innovation pipeline and how how strong is your pipeline and think about it. You want a lot of ideas up front and as you whittle it down to consumer research, et cetera, to make sure you've got it. But I think the other dynamic that big business needs to be aware of is that things change. And an idea that may have been good pre-pandemic is no longer good now. And I think it also brings into the question the, the, the concept of agility and the recognition that changing consumer circumstances may require different tasks to be able to win in that space. So it's about having that innovation culture, having a, a pipeline that you can draw on, and ultimately making sure that you've got the agility to be able to make the changes as required. And I would imagine, Savesh, this forms a large part of the thinking behind, I mean, we saw it in the news a couple of days ago, Tiger Brands, 100 million Rand VC fund for sort of food launches and innovating in that space. I mean, that's really what, what, you, what you're saying here, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I've thankfully been uh, a part of that team, sort of uh, managing it until we, we formally set it up, which will be in, uh, in a few weeks' time. But it's been hugely exciting. But I think the germination of that idea, and it's not new, right? Businesses around the world have been doing this for many years. Um, admittedly, maybe we, we flow to the party, but we finally arrive and hopefully you can make a big impact. Exactly to that point, we also recognize that great ideas come from anywhere, not just within your organization. Whether you use the likes of consultants to bring in great ideas, whether you have good processes internally or not, you can always come great ideas that come from outside. And if you, Think about the, the South African entrepreneur or the African entrepreneur and how they get things going. I mean, the amount of ideas that we've been flooded with since the announcement last week has been overwhelming. And we really are looking for more of those to really say, what is it that's going to sort of tap into the, um, uh, the zeitgeist of the South African consumer going forward? How does it appeal to all of the consumer trends that we are experiencing and align to our company strategy? And how then do we allow those opportunities to help drive the growth of Tiger into the next 100 years. So it's hugely exciting and uh, yeah, something that we expect will further complement our cycle of growth. 
And so just to add to something Savish said, sorry, Ari, is that I think it's very important for us to understand that as much as COVID has brought in a lot of change, there are still some fundamentals that actually remain in place, right? So we may be working from home, but consumers still want convenience, right? Even if they're still working from home, they still need energy throughout the day because your days are actually much longer. So I think even when you're developing those innovation pipelines or when you're getting those ideas, it's important to not pivot completely because there are just some fundamentals that will always remain in place. The need for convenience, the need for value for money, the need for energy to perform throughout the day, those will always be there. So let's not just throw everything everything out. Let's just stick to the fundamentals as well still. Yeah, and I think, sorry, I mean, if I could, no. oh, sorry. Yes. I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, I completely echo what Yandi's saying, you know, I think it's very important to also just identify what trends are new and are going to stay, right? So what has long-term potential? What trends already exist that are still true, as Yandi said, you know, the need for energy, uh, et cetera. And, you know, what trends are actually just short-term lived, right? So, you know, there's certain things which, uh, I don't know, because of COVID, it might have had a three-month impact, but post that, actually, it's not a relevant trend anymore, right? So it's also very important, like Yandy said, not to pivot completely, because if you understand the trends and you understand what is not a long-term trend, if you decide to pivot your strategies and go after it, you might be actually, you might be chasing after the wrong opportunity. And then talk to me for a second about, you know, the role of, of research and understanding the consumer in, in all of this and how much, you know, energy brands you think in South Africa are really putting into kind of researching and understanding consumers um, and, and what that consumer landscape kind of, of looks like, because obviously you're reacting to that, but, but adding a layer to that, sometimes people also don't know what they want until you give it to them. So, so sort of bridging that divide between the researchers saying this, I know that there's going to be a post-COVID world, and I also just want to give something to people that they haven't experienced before. How do you sort of delve in between those three different buckets? Yeah, very interesting question, Ari. Um, so I think, you know, exactly like how everyone has said, you need to have a culture of innovation. I think organizations also need to have a culture of being embedded in their consumers' lives, right? So you have to really step into your consumers' reality, right? Whether that was pre-COVID, during COVID, or post-COVID, if you're really in touch with your consumers, you, you'll be able to adapt your strategies, right? You'll be able to be agile because you are in tune with your consumers, right? And I think, you know, people always think about consumer research and they think about it as, oh, I've got to spend so much money to get my consumer insights. But the world has evolved, right? Research is no longer traditional. So you don't actually have to commission a huge study to get insights. You can talk to your family members. You can talk to your neighbor across the street. You can talk to um, a random person in the shopping mall, right? Or while you're doing your grocery shopping, if you see somebody do something, there's no harm in just saying, sorry, excuse me, I just want to understand why did you pick up that product instead of the other one, right? The, the insights around us, I think another important development within our world is we actually have access to social media, right? So you can often track the social media conversations that are happening, right? And through that, you'll actually find out what consumers want, what they think. Consumers are extremely vocal. Um, they, they're more vocal, I think, online than they are offline, right? So I think there's a wealth of information. There's a wealth of accessibility that organizations can draw upon. It's just about trying to understand, like I said earlier, you know, what trend is permanent, what trend just needs to be tweaked, and what trend is actually doesn't have the long-term sustainability. And I see the rest of the panel is very eager to get in on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, Zaini, why I'm actually eager is because you make such valid points. Ari, what I've seen with organizations is during tough times, the research budget gets cut completely. And um, this is something that we've seen in the past with marketing budgets used to get cut, but I think marketers have learned that you actually need to spend more during a pandemic, right? So I really just urge um, urge um, companies that this is the time to be investing in research, investing in talking to your consumers, investing in, in knowing where they are, how their behaviors have, um, have, have really changed. So what, I've, what I also like about what I've seen with the pandemic, Ari, is that I've actually seen brands be very brave and actually launch new innovations because 
every study that I read last year was saying, this is not the time to innovate, hold back on innovations. I mean, you saw Tiger Brands at the beginning of the year launched um, a line extension on their bars. Kellogg now has launched uh, cereals and some um, snacking uh, innovation now in March. So I'm actually very much encouraged when I'm actually seeing that brands are actually not holding back on their marketing budgets and their marketing spend, and they're actually getting products in the market. Now, my, my request to brands would be, can you also just invest just as much on research um, and, and development? So that, that's the only build, Zaini, I, I wanted to. Sure. So I you allow me as well, just a short build on, on everything. Uh, maybe just to share a bit of learnings we've had. So I think your question first talk about what Mita has informed the evolution of snacking and how do we tap into what consumers are looking for differently. And I agree that research is an ongoing process. It isn't always commissioned, it isn't always expensive, but it's an ongoing understanding of what consumers are looking for. And R&D pays a part in it and uh, uh, budgets to be able to market the innovation is all important. But from a research perspective, which informs the actions you take, uh, Tiger, because we have such a big portfolio of brands, the basket of brands, we recently commissioned a um, consumption of food study uh, to really understand how do consumers interact with the categories and the brands that we have and how do we begin to understand that a bit more so that we can a understand the role we play currently or the role we're not playing and how does that feed into the innovation space that we need to develop the pipeline that i spoke about earlier and a few interesting stats right is that when you speak about snacking because that's where the focus is for today is that meal times the traditional meal times so your three meals a day it's no longer as important as it used to be. In fact, for a large segment of our population, it was never that important. We talk about breakfast being the most important meal of the day and you need to get your all so that you geared up and et cetera, et cetera. But what consumers are saying to us is that meal times are blurring. And even more so now when you are working from home and you're having to sort of jump from one meeting click to another meeting click, uh, you don't really have the time for that mo movement to allow yourself to grab something in the canteen or otherwise, um, or the pantry even if it's close enough. And the blurring of meal times really points to the fact that as meal or, or snack solutions, companies need to become a lot more aware of how we fill that blurring meal occasion as much as we do the three established meal occasions. And in that, let's see how big a part that plays within our pipeline. And, and I can, I can and, and from Tiger's perspective, um, beyond what we've seen going on in the market so far, you can expect a lot more of that to come through. So be able to satisfy the need that consumers are saying they have. So it's an interesting space, ever evolving, but I think this blurring for us is something that's very important to understand as to how do we fit in within that in-between meal occasion. Oh, the poor ad agencies that have to take the brief that says it's now targeted at the whole day versus just one point in the day. Um, but I want to pick up, you know, we're speaking a lot about kind of um, trends and that kind of thing. I want to pick up on the big conversation, and it's preempted by George um, on the live chat. Um, George jokes and he says, snacking should carry a warning like alcohol, snack responsibly. How much uh, weight have you gained over this pandemic? And there is an extensive amount of social media rhetoric to snacking companies to improve the ingredients of their product or to be kind of um, more conscious of the role that they play in how healthy or unhealthy a nation is um, but I mean, you know, the, the sales aren't going to lie. And there's a sweets aisle and a chocolate aisle in a store, and it's the size that it is for a reason because people enjoy it. So when we start putting kind of the health lens onto onto snacking, is it um, is it what we see on social media? Are people really demanding this, or is it really just about finding a balance between the two? And and is it something that you know, as as brands um, and marketing leaders within the organisations, are you really driving that agenda, or do we think that the market for that is actually smaller than what it is? I'm going to leave this open to, to anyone that wants to jump in. And I'm only asking this question because I have a serious uh, chocolate and sort of sugar addiction. And the last thing I want is for them to remove that from the house. So I'd, I'd love for them to keep innovating in that space. Zainab, maybe let me come to you with that question. Perfect. Yeah. So I think, Ari, I think the category of healthier alternatives is still evolving in South Africa. So I think it's relevant. 
um, it's probably not as relevant as it is in some of our global counterparts, right? I think if you look at markets like Australia or the UK, you know, these are markets that are really looking for and adapting their lifestyles for a healthy alternative. But I think the need is definitely there. And if you want to capitalize on the trend, you have to start innovating in this space, right? So I'll give you an example um, with halls, you know, which is actually a snack, um, you know, the range is um, actually sugared candy, right? And we know we've experienced a lot of issues, a lot of consumers dropping out of it because they're a little bit more health conscious. And they're saying, actually, we don't consume it anymore because of the sugar content. So last year, and it was part of the pipeline, so it was perfect with COVID, we actually launched um, sugar-free halls. So you now get halls that is sugar-free and it was just about adapting the messaging and letting consumers know you've asked for it. Here's what we have for you. Here is sugar-free halls. Is it the biggest thing in our portfolio yet? Probably not. But five years from now, 100%, we believe that trend is going to be a lot more relevant. A lot more um, consumers are going to shift in that direction. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing is also about pricing you have to be very conscious about pricing. So consumers say they want healthy alternatives. They're not always willing to pay a premium price for it. So as companies, it's, I guess, our responsibility to try and make healthier alternatives still affordable and accessible to the mass market. Yeah. So on the health and wellness trend, Ari, I'd actually like to answer that. You know, there's that saying, men lie, women lie, but numbers don't lie. And I think yeah. this, this is where this actually comes in. If, if you actually look at the Nielsen data for the past 12 months versus a year ago, right? Within snacking in particular, the volume numbers are actually down within snacking and the number of packs sold are actually down within snacking, right? But if you actually delve into the data, because there's obviously sub-segments within the snacking category, what you actually see in terms of the numbers that are up in value and in volume is nuts, nougat, which has healthy ingredients, it's popcorn, and um, it's just nuts, nougat, popcorn. So all the, all the sub-segments that are geared more towards health and wellness. So the numbers, they are actually not lying. It's saying that even though the, the snacking category is down and all the sweet, chocolatey foods are down, all the, all the healthier segments, sub-segments are actually seeing a rise in value and volume. So that should actually answer your question on whether is health and wellness really as important as, as people tell us it is. That is definitely a trend that we're seeing. And what you also need to do is look at other categories. If you look at cereal, for instance, granola is exploding and, and growing double digit. And that's because it's a healthier taste indulgence. So you're still getting the taste, but now health has become more important. So consumers are, don't feel as guilty as they used to. So health and wellness is definitely a trend that is here to stay. And the numbers are actually reflecting that. And could I maybe just add a little bit onto that? So, I mean, at Tiger Brands, we, we recognize this and, and we take it incredibly seriously. We have a property called Eat Well, Live Well that has been around for more than a decade now. And what we've been doing over the past little while is just increasing its prevalence in the marketplace. I mean, it's a little green logo that uh, says EWLW that you will find on all of Tiger Brand products that really give consumers an easy way to identify products that are good for you or not as good for you. And uh, and September, and we mentioned a study last year and published a report in December calling, calling the state of the nutrition uh, state of nutrition report um, in South Africa, which really presented a scorecard of how consumers had done uh, over the pandemic and how were they doing at that point in time. And interestingly, just two of the stats from there is that 49% of consumers admitted to having gaining weight, gained weight over that period, and 51% claimed to have eaten more snacks and treats. Now, that is something that uh, I think none of us actually want to. We want to eat the snacks and treats, but not actually gain the weight. So I think the combination of those two actually points to something that we need to try and do. But, but I mean, the full report is available on ewlw.co.za. But it points to some really important facts that we need to be able to shift. Now, if you talk about our consumers moving enough into that space, I think the report suggests that consumers want to eat healthy, but they're not able to eat healthy. And it could be a combination of price. And I'm still, and it, it's something that we're trying to drive quite hard, is that why should healthy be expensive? 
Why should it be more expensive? Why are healthier products not at the same price or cheaper than it, than it lets healthy alternatives on the shelf? That's the first one. The second one is, we often, when we look at marketing, we don't profile the healthy products as often, right? If you look at the product that we've got on shelf, and Tiger Brands is taking a more active stance on this now, is around, if a product is good for you, are we saying enough about it on tap even? Are we saying 35% less this, 40% less that? And are we making those products the heroes of our campaign? Because ordinarily, it would be the product that rips in the mind of consumers from, if you're a 100-year-old company, for 100 years ago, but without really changing that dynamic to profile the, the hero product. And, and that's something that does need to change. And I suppose for consumers that are listening in, of which each one of us are as well, I think the recognition is that it's not about going from zero to hero overnight. It's about making better choices for yourself, right? So Ari, if you want the, that good bar, that's great. Uh, but importantly, understanding if it doesn't carry a stamp of approval like the Eat Well, the World would do, and often many companies don't, quite honestly, it's about understanding that you should import portion control. So rather than having that entire slab of beacon, maybe have half the slab uh, or, or a few pieces. I mean, and at the back of that, you'd actually see that we give some guidance as to what the right portion uh, size is for that particular tree. So I think making better choices and companies making a, taking a more active stance on highlighting the products that are better for you, profiling them as part of your campaigns, and at minimum, making sure that portion control messaging exist on all products that maybe aren't the best for you uh, in abundance. So a lot of internal moderation that has to happen before you kind of just uh, decide what the look and feel of the product is going to be, because what is the information that's on that pack? Um, I think we're picking up on some really interesting sort of points this morning in our discussion around snacking on uh, the red zone on the financial mail platform. Um, and we are still live. Uh, there's a question here or a comment rather from Candice. Candice says, uh, Zainab, this is just a voice from one of your consumers. Halls is my go-to remedy when I lose my voice, and that happens often. Um, so it's not just candy for me, um, but my voice to the world. So thank you for that. Um, and Nebs says that uh, sugar and salty products are more addictive, therefore resulting greater consumption, which is beneficial for business. And uh, there's a lot of conspiracy theories when it comes to the snacking industry. You know, there's conspiracy around how they package it. There's conspiracy around even when you do give a recommended daily allowance, it's like, well, who's decided that? Who says that 6% is right? They don't know how tall I am how thin I am with my body mass index is. Um, you know, they're using a purple color on the packaging because they know that purple is about enjoyment and fulfillment. I mean, there's a million and one different conspiracy theories, um, and, and even more so now after kind of COVID. Um, but I mean, those can't really inform what the brand is, is actually kind of thinking um, and feeling in terms of what they take to market. I want to kind of land out this, this sort of segment of our, of our discussion, though, in terms of what are the big trends that you think that we're going to be seeing in the future? And Zainab, I'm going to come to you first. So we know that health we've debated, we've discussed is something that people care about. You know, there's a broader theme around sustainability. We see a lot of the bigger brands now speaking about how the product is made and putting emphasis on that as we move into a more eco-friendly world. Um, but trends moving forward in a world where we have no idea when people are snacking, because now you've all told me that it's blurred, blurred consumption. Um, but what are some of those trends you think as we, as we sort of round out 2021 and move forward post pandemic? Yeah, so um, Ari, I think you've touched on maybe two of the biggest ones, right? So I think provenance and sustainability, you know, whether it's through your sourcing or your packaging strategy is 100% more important than it was a couple of years ago, right? It's a trend that's going to stay. Um, I think we've seen the shifts, right? So we've seen Woolworths um, say no to plastic bags, right? If you forget your black Woolies bag, which I probably have a hundred of in my house, but I always forget to take it into the store, I'm always buying another black Woolies sustainable bag, right? So consumers are adopting to that. They are requesting more. I think if you look at the likes of Adidas with their um, policy on, um, you know, their shoes and they're creating shoes from recyclable plastic, right? 
Um, so packaging is very important. And then I think just from a sourcing point of view, you know, consumers do want to know where is the food coming from, right? I know Kellogg's is really honest on their journey around this, about their sustainable sourcing. Um, recently with uh, Cadbury, there's this cocoa life movement. So it's really showing that all of the cocoa used in the Cadbury chocolates is sustainable, um, you know, and it's going to a higher purpose. You know, this is how we're helping the communities um, who are sourcing the cocoa sustainably for our products, right? So definitely that's a trend that needs to stay. The second one about healthy alternatives, I'm really not going to touch on because I think we've um, discussed this at length. Um, but, uh, you know, another interesting trend for me is the rise of e-commerce. So I think the pandemic has actually... Um, uh, like catapulted e-commerce, right? So e-commerce globally is rising. There's markets that are way advanced. So the likes of China, it's insane, right? South Africa was always on the back burner, but I think the pandemic really helped us. We've seen innovation, right? The Checker 6060 app is life-changing. I mean, I really don't like going into stores anymore, right? But that has a huge impact on impulse categories, right? Because that checkout zone, that impulse zone where consumers normally stand in and, you know, this is where we try to catch them, you know, um, it doesn't exist anymore, right? So you need to create a virtual checkout line. You have to make sure that your products are actually present on all the e-commerce platforms, right? So I think when the pandemic hit, everyone was like knocking on take lots doors to say, I need to get my product ranged here, right? Um, I've seen sampling through this platform, right? I've actually seen Kellogg sample through Take A Lot. I've ordered something and next thing I've got a free sample of Kellogg cereal in my box. I'm like, oh, this is interesting because actually with COVID, people don't want to sample in store anymore, right? So the landscape has changed. People are a lot more conscious about um, safety and hygiene. So it has impacted some of our strategies. So I think for me, one of the biggest trends that I maybe wanted to talk about, which is not really related to our food, but more related to how people shop our food, is definitely the rise of e-commerce. And for any company who is not focusing on e-commerce at the moment, you're probably on the back foot um, of the pandemic. And this is where your competitors are probably gaining a bit of an advantage over you. And I know everyone's going to want to weigh in on the e-commerce um, debate. So I'm actually just going to hand it over to, to you to talk a little bit about kind of the role of e-commerce, because obviously it still represents a very small um, percentage of how people are consuming those kinds of products, but definitely moving into the into the future, that that's that's going to be the way that a lot of people are going to start um, sort of purchasing. Um, so Yanni, maybe let me come to you on the topic of e-commerce as, as the person that uh, is part of uh, what does consult to the brand that does add something extra to the take a lot orders. Um, what, what, is, what is the role of e-commerce moving forward, do you think? Wow. Um, I think Zaini has pretty much touched on, on, on most of it. Um, I think Ari, with the lack of mobility uh, that consumers have, e-commerce is going to become more, more important than ever. But I think not just as a, a, a point of purchase for consumers, but also advertising space for brands and also sampling opportunities. I mean, Zainab uh, did mention we uh, Kellogg, we did actually sample uh, some of the new innovations on Take A Lot. So we're actually building partnerships with, with, with e-commerce e platforms uh, such as Take A Lot. So I think Zaini's pretty much covered uh, everything, but the retail landscape has changed. And brands just need to move with the times and need to move with consumers' needs. And being online, shopping online is, is where consumers are actually getting their information. So it's also an educational platform as well. So beyond a, a marketing platform, a shopping platform, it's also an opportunity to educate consumers around your brands and the goodness of your brands, which Savesh spoke about, and the value that your brands actually bring to consumers. So still very, very small in South Africa, but something that will definitely explode as um, some of the societal shifts uh, that COVID has brought in are still here to uh, still here to stay. And so, Vesh, let me let me add a layer quickly before you jump in on the e-commerce debate um, with a little bit of a, a kind of a juxtaposition. You know, we're seeing um, with sort of content, right? We're seeing with Netflix, with HBO, with Disney, all these different platforms now not wanting to be on one platform, but to actually own their own platform. So, building into that e-commerce discussion. 
Um, do you foresee a future where brands themselves are the e-commerce platform? Or do you think that in a South African context, we're really always going to consistently be distributing through retail partners? Or what do you think that future landscape looks like? Sure. Um, very challenging, right? I wish I had a crystal ball, but I'll give you my personal opinion. Um, and first, let me just pick up on e-commerce. I think for me, it's not about e-commerce, right? Because it's about consumer convenience. Because even if you think about retail, when retail probably, I mean, when ShopRite started with one store and then two stores, five stores, now hundreds, if not thousands of stores, the benefit to them is the convenience that affords the consumers around the corner being able to access that offering that they've got. And that's for me what e-commerce does now. It provides convenience to consumers to say, I can shop any time of the day or night. I may only get my delivery when they open, but even then it's delivered to me rather than me having to go there. But, but how do you give them that convenience? And finding the, the sweet spot, I mean, I agree with Zainab that you have to be thinking about it. And at minimum, you've got to be on the existing platform. So uh, the, the guys that have the sort of uh, brick to brick solutions that you can easily tap into. But now leading into your point, Arya, is that is there a single, uh, does Tiger Brands have a vision to be a single solution of an e-commerce uh, perspective versus only piggybacking on the existing platform? We'd love to, but we're not going to do it out of vanity. We're going to do it because consumers want to. I think that we're probably in a very fortunate space that we have a basket of goods that if you had to in inspect any store data around what was purchased, we have um, wide representation across what consumers would actually purchase at Mantem. Now, whether that's perfectly primed to say you become a subscription-based offering that people say, I will always want an all, always want a can of baked beans, sugar beans, pickled beans, I always want a beacon uh, slab for my uh, indulgence, rice, pasta, I mean, you name it, the portfolio is so broad. So it probably does point to the fact that we have a better chance of landing our own um, e-commerce platform that consumes, but we will always be led by consumers because I think a lot of vanity can go into saying, look at this wonderful e-commerce site I've built, but if no one's actually clicking on there because it's not convenient for them, then you've actually just created the white elephant. Now, one example of how this has been done well is PepsiCo in the US. They've, I think they created a, a, an e-commerce platform called the Pantry, Pantry Shop, Pantry, something of that sort, but effectively PepsiCo does have a lot of snacking brands. And what they've done is created a snacking basket that they've done exactly that. They've said, shop here for all of your snacking goods. And uh, and I think that was quite, um, it was very good of them to understand what the consumers were purchasing and obviously being able to influence it. So if you were buying a Dorito and a few other purchases out of the basket, but not buying others, you're now almost being encouraged, strongly encouraged to buy the full PepsiCo basket out of that. So I think in some spaces it makes sense, uh, in some spaces less so. And I think we always want to be dri driven by what consumers want rather than vanity. And also Ari, I think in the South African context, right, you can't speak about things like e-commerce without speaking about things such as the high data costs, which is something we've seen, we've been, people have been talking about augmented reality. Um, brands are always talk to brands about investing in augmented reality, giving consumers an experience, a great experience. But then the challenge that always comes up is, but our data costs are expensive and most of our consumers don't have access to data. So that is probably one of the challenges that we probably see in South Africa with regards to e-commerce. The second challenge is you can't speak about uh, te technological innovation and things like e-commerce, uh, which is obviously then ends up being a delivery service to consumers without speaking about the spat spatial planning in South Africa, where most people are actually not even in areas where uh, your take a lot actually delivered to. So if you are a brand and a company and you are thinking of investing in e-commerce, you, you then need to think, okay, how am I going to get my product to Emadadiele? How am I going to get it to Ekugule? To, well, you know, so those are also some of the challenges that brands would actually experience, which in more developed countries, um, you know, those are challenges that they don't really have. So these are some of, just giving you some insight into some of the things that brands need to think about in the South African context, as opposed to, um, you know, an Australia or, or, or United States. So that, that, those are some of the challenges. As great as e-commerce is, there are actually challenges uh, with, with those platforms. And I think that that's a, an interesting point to kind of um, begin to, to wrap the conversation 
um, because we do have so many intricacies in the South African context. We have such a diverse socioeconomic landscape. We have such a different multitude of genres of consumers that live in different places that respond to things differently. We have cultural nuances. Um, we really have very interesting things for a marketer to try and get their value proposition out there and into the hearts and minds of consumers. Um, rounding out the e-commerce debate, Neb says, um, and this is probably what's keeping Zainab up at night, how do you increase your snacking basket size for groceries as in-store placement has assisted with this? And don't worry, Zainab's on it. She's going to sort it out. Tiger Brands are on it. Yandy's got the strategy for it, so don't stress. They're going to come come and explain that soon. When you're at checkout, I can guarantee you that in six to 10 months from now, it's going to say, don't you want to add this at a discounted rate, just like you were if you were in that Woolworths checkout aisle. Um, but I want to start to kind of land the conversation um, and sort of get your messages um, to the broader sort of snacking ecosystem in South Africa, to people that are looking to break into the food and beverage industry, um, to people that have maybe changed what they've done now because of COVID-19 and are worried about what that's going to look like in a post-pandemic world. Um, but just sort of your rounding closing thoughts on the world of snacking, on what it takes to be successful, what you think some of the trends are, um, and ultimately what your takeaway is um, to people who are trying to get their snack to cut through the clutter. And uh, let me come to let me come to you first, Anna. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think I have three pieces of advice, right? So I think my first thing would be about being consumer centric, and I think it's something that we've spoken about at length in this call as well, right? So. Um, whatever you are doing, just make sure that your consumers are at the heart of it, right? Make sure that it's founded in an insight, whether it's an insight that consumers know they they like want or, or do not know, you know, but I think it's important about just being consumer centric, um, you know, and remembering who our South African consumers are, right? I think Yandi alluded to this as well, right? We have such a it's such an interesting market to work in because we truly do own the premise of a developed market and an emerging market, right? Um, I think often South Africa gets capitalized or, or put under the bucket of emerging market. But when we have a developed market, we truly are a developed market, right? But there is a huge emerging market. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, if you really want to win, if you really want to succeed, you need to remember the mass market. Right. So the aspirant consumers, you know, that eventually are going to make their way up the emerging middle class, which is the hugest segment within um, South Africa. Right. So be in tune with your consumers, be in touch with them, be consumer centric. Um, my second point, which I think, again, you know, everyone on the call has alluded to, but it's about being agile in your innovation strategy. Right. So agility is key. It's a buzzword, I think, in every single organization. But I think with that, you know, organizations or consumers or little home organizations need to remember don't be a fear don't be afraid of failure right so you know there is that stat about not every single innovation is successful right so you have to be brave you have to take risks i mean inform risks right because we all don't have um i guess the backing of a, a corporate company or a global company to see us through if something fails you know but take informed risks you know um if that means launching in a in a small community first or you know testing it with a couple of consumers before you actually go into a full scale launch do that but be agile in your innovation be brave take the risk and i think my last point is about being collaborative right being collaborative whether this is with um, your customers, your retailers, your consumers, you know, like Savish mentioned, you know, the, the innovation hub, you know, and getting ideas from your consumers, but be collaborative, right? I think another example, you know, just touching on the e-commerce conversation, but there was actually, I think it was in the UK, but Pringles needed to develop an e-commerce strategy and they partnered with Coca-Cola, right? So are there other brands, are there other companies that you can capitalize on? You know, are there partnerships, you know, branded partnerships that you can look into? So be collaborative and maximize your opportunities. So I think that would be my three points. Yandi, let me come to you for some sort of closing, closing thoughts. Just hit that unmute. Okay. Sorry. I think, geez, Ari, there's so much. I think the first thing is context um, matters, right? Um, and you need to, brands need to understand their consumers' context. Uh, you know, COVID is a global pandemic. So you must just now think global, but act local. Your The context of your consumers has changed. 
Therefore, you may still be launching innovations, but you know the, the content you put out must speak to consumers' new context. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing in the South African context as well would be in terms of value. Now we need, now more than ever, we need to actually offer consumers value for money. You know, the, the purse is tight, um, you know, consumers are struggling. What value is your brand bringing? So you can bring this through, you know, ingredients, through packaging, through um, different formats, but you really need to now start thinking of value just beyond price. The, the third thing, um, Ari, is really around which Zaini uh, touched on. If you want to stay ahead, you're going to actually have to innovate. So innovate against those consumer needs, innovate against those behavioral changes, collaborate internally to innovate. But also what I would also say to brands is please cross collaborate with other brands in other categories as well, because you'll find that now the lines are just getting so blurred. Um, you know, cereal competes in snacking now. You know, snacking competes within breakfast. So the, the collaboration is important, not more important now than ever. The final thing, I know I said the final thing was the final thing, but this is the final thing is, you know, are at the end of the day, your consumers all have passion points, right? And really innovate around those passion, uh, innovate around those passion points because they're not going anywhere. You look at your Pringles, for instance, is has just launched a, a passport um, variant, which is a variant, variant from Asia and a variant from Italy. And where that comes from is consumers still want to travel, but they can't. So we will actually bring the travel to you. So brands must now bring everything that consumers couldn't do, but are still passionate about, bring it to them. Even with Lays, they've just launched an innovation now with Samuel Eto, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, around the Champions League. You can't go to the Champions League, but we'll bring the Champions League to you. So consumers' passions, guys, their context may have cha changed, their behavior may have changed, but those passion points still haven't changed. So brands, let's innovate around those passion points because they are going nowhere. If you loved soccer before COVID, you will still love soccer now. So those are just some of my parting points. So Vish, the, the final minutes or two go to you. Yeah, I'm gonna be quick. So let me, I mean, uh, the going third in the list of what, what we used to get doesn't leave many options for me to go with, but let me just summarize the thought. The first is consumer relevant, and it sort of encompasses everything we spoke about, consumer sensitivity, trends, etc. If you're not relevant, you're not gonna get picked up. Uh, don't be different because you don't say same, same, but different. It's, it's the same thing. Be distinctive. So in your proposition, make sure that you are distinctive in what you bring forward. And this is as much for the big corporates as it is for the startup that's looking to make a difference. And I think in the venture capital space, as I've now been involved with for private brands, is that there are too many products that are just similar, but you need to be able to create that, that uh, distinctiveness to be able to cut through the clutter as Ari, you mentioned. And the last one is just bring passion to everything you do and they'll come through in what you put forward. And it's not just about ticking the boxes of the innovation process. It's not just about ticking the boxes of getting listed, but about bringing through your passions, not just in your product, but also in your marketing, because being relevant is one thing and comes through in your product. Being distinctive uh, should also come through in the way you speak to consumers. And hopefully with a combination of all of that, you have the, the makings of a great snack success. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for picking up on some of those uh, key highlighted words there. Consumer centricity, agility, innovation, collaboration, context, um, passion points, value, um, and certainly some interesting thoughts uh, coming through this morning. Um, good luck to the three of you in uh, bringing this all to life and continuing to bring it to life as the uh, ecosystems and the consumer landscapes continue to change. We certainly have some incredible snack value propositions in South Africa and some, as we've seen now, amazing people behind the uh, boardroom tables making it all happen. Thank you so much uh, for joining us in this morning's Financial Mail Red Zone in conversation, the science behind snacking and delicious marketing tactics for 2021. We heard there from Savesh Sitaram, a corporate and group marketing strategy director at Tiger Brands, who's waiting for your uh, proposal to spend his 100 million venture capital fund. Uh, Zainab Mohammed is also on the call there, a category brand manager for Candy at Mondelez International, and Yandisa Hene, chief innovation officer at Yanda Innovation Consultants. Thank you so much to our panel. Um, the only thing missing from this conversation was snacks, but next time we'll come uh, far more prepared um, and we'll see you again in our next uh, Red Zone In Conversation where we'll tackle the debate of mad men versus mad maths. Till next time, cheers. <laughs>